guys all for coming tonight. Um, just raise your hand if you, do you like the new venue? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, because um, we're just trying to, to make sure that we can have a place where we can film it um, and get good lighting and get a good acoustics and also make it easy for everyone to walk in here. Um, my name is Joe Gatos. I work with the CDOC Society. I want to thank all of our Camp or Kyla partners. Um, and this is, I think, about the ninth year that we've been doing this lecture series with Camp or Kyla. Um, so just a big round of applause for them. Can you guys see this poster around town? Yeah. Awesome. So we have a couple left. So if you have a favorite coffee shop where you don't see one, no, I don't want to take these home tonight. Let me know, Mart uh, Marta, if you want one for your classroom or something. We can do that. In the back, there's some information, uh, some information to Camp or Kyla. There's some wildlife posts. All that stuff's free. Sea-Doc sticker for your water bottle or your car. Um, go ahead and take that and then sign up. If you guys want to get email notifications or if you want to get wildlife posts free or you want to get more information on Camp or Kyla, just sign up in the back. You can do it on paper or you can do it electronically on the iPad back there. Um, and I wanted to thank all of our uh, sponsors. We love being able to have this thing for free. And I think we get a real great diversity in the crowd because of that. And we wouldn't be able to do it without our sponsors. So I want to thank Tom Averna, Deer Harbor Charters, uh, Barbara Bentley, and her husband, Glenn Presswich, um, Audrey and Dean Stuckey, who can't be here tonight, Barbara Brown, who I think I saw here tonight, <coughs> and West Sound Marina. So let's give them a big round of applause. Yay! to introduce our speaker, Dr. Peter Chase. How'd I do? Good. RCs. How's that? I'll say it the American way, he can correct me later. So uh, <laughs> Peter is uh, uh, actually uh, an amazing and, and quite famous scientist who's done, who's trained as a botanist, but has done all kind of cool ecology work and bird work, and he's going to be talking on a whole variety of things here tonight. Um, he's a professor at UBC. He is actually uh, from this side of the border, and so he's got this transboundary thing going on that we like a whole bunch. He's done a lot of work in the Gulf Islands and the San Juan Islands, um, so he knows this area very well, and I'll let him take it over from there. Good. Big round of applause. Thank you. Hey. Well, th thanks very much. It's, it's lovely to see so many people here and to be back in the islands. I, I was surprised to see a Camp Orkaila t-shirt. The last time I spent the night on uh, Orcas Island was probably 1963 at Camp Orkaila. And so uh, I grew up in Seattle. I grew up in the Georgia Basin. I uh, spent my whole life in the islands. Uh, when I was a university student at University of Washington, I used to uh, dig uh, gooey ducks for three cents a pound at Port Ludlow on the weekends, uh, try and pay some bills. And so, like a lot of you, I've seen a lot of things change uh, over the past 50-some uh, years uh, in the basin. I remember, uh, I remember when we used to catch 12 salmon as our limit at the bar at uh, the Columbia River. Um, and you don't do that anymore. I remember when uh, green sturgeon and white sturgeon were pretty common things on our table, and uh, we don't do that anymore. Um, so one of my interests has been studying change and, and particularly trying to figure out the kinds of things that cause change. Uh, here in the Northwest, uh, in East Africa, I've worked on ungulates quite a lot in Serengeti, Tanzania. And of course, a lot of the things that happen in the world are pretty easily diagnosable as direct actions of humans and the environment. Overharvest of white sturgeon, uh, overharvest of salmon, or putting up dams uh, preventing salmon from proliferating in the Columbia over time. But one of the more interesting things to me has been kind of working on what I think of as the indirect effects on humans. And I guess what I'd like you to consider this evening uh, is that uh, you actually and me uh, might be having bigger effects on the environment through the indirect actors that we influence uh, rather than the direct things we do, like harvest. And so I'm going to talk about indirect effects, and I'm going to give you several examples of the kinds of indirect effects that humans have. I'm going to kind of weave that into a story about change in the basin and some of the things that we're doing to try and uh, stop some of the negative changes that we think are happening and perhaps uh, accept and even embrace some of the other changes that might at first appear negative but might just be uh, some things kind of getting better. So uh, uh, what I'll do is um, start off uh, talking about uh, a very simple observation we make when we're thinking about change and how we try and understand uh, our impacts on the environment. And here are two slides, uh, one from the edge of the Serengeti, actually the edge of the Ngorongoro on the left there 
You can see a tree line in the back, perhaps, and that's the Ngorongoro Reserve, and you can see agricultural land in front of that. And the other is uh, the center of my old study area up in Kogatendi Ridge near the Mara River in the northern Serengeti. And we usually often look at places like this, inside parks that we think of as relatively natural versus outside parks, and measure the difference in those two places as our actions on the environment. Uh, but one of the things we find is that <clears throat> uh, we're often surprised when we compare those protected areas to the areas we've developed, because of course the protected areas we assume are doing a job for us, that they're maintaining examples of more or less native systems and species. And one of the observations that's been made repeatedly over the past several decades is that's not always the case. And it really came to, uh, uh, to, to the fore for me when I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin for several years. There in the upper Midwest, a famous plant ecologist uh, named Whitaker, who described the plant succession and other things, uh, was interested in describing the upper uh, North American ecosystems and did so by putting in uh, a few hundred plots. I, I hear something. There you go. There. Um, a, a bunch of plots to describe ecosystems of the upper Midwest. And it was interesting when I was there as a, as a uh, professor, Tom Rooney was doing his PhD and he was interested in describing change too. And so one of the things that was, he was able to do is go back to those plots that Whitaker had put in and just look at the rates of change. And these are vegetation plots. So kind of these were uh, about 20 by 20 meter square plots where Whitaker went and described the cover of all the plant species in there and then identified, of course, all those species. And Tom made a very uh, kind of basic observation that most botanists would expect to make. He went back and when he looked, he, he refound 115 of those plots and he said on average about 18 percent of species were gone. And that's not too surprising because in a fixed area plot the size of the room, you might imagine over 50 years plants come and go but might stay extant on the landscape. But the real, the real crux was that when Tom compared the rates of extinction of plants in plots, uh, depending on where those plots were, he found that more than half of species have disappeared from plots that were located inside parks uh, and much, many fewer outside parks. And of course this was a real kind of scary surprise and Tom really wanted to know why. And, and the reason why is if you've ever been to the upper Midwest is because of course most of that area is, a, is agricultural area now and in those areas there's lots of waste grain, whether it's corn or other kinds of things stuff that sits on the ground, either like in this year when there's a drought, uh, it's not worth the farmer's time to go out and harvest it. So that corn will sit on the ground and it will feed deer. And those deer will retire into parks during the hunting season or during the day just to find shelter in trees. And of course in the spring as trilliums are coming up or other palatable species, the deer are still evolved to respond to those tasty little morsels as they come and go but they're much more abundant than they used to be, up to 250 animals per hectare in some places, or two per square kilometer in some places in Wisconsin. So what we're finding is that in many places, protected areas simply aren't doing the job that we expect. They're not maintaining valued species and ecosystems, and a lot of people are talking about the need to conserve, uh, that, that in order to conserve native species, we're gonna have to think more seriously about stewardship, potentially working inside parks to control the abundance of species, in this case, white-tailed deer. And so this is a classic indirect effect. Uh, changing the landscape, getting rid of predators, allowing herbivore populations to rise up, and essentially uh, having hundreds of lawnmowers out on the landscape that are modifying the environment, whether or not you're really doing anything about it. We've got a whole bunch of agents essentially acting for us that are driving much of what we see. And this is really a, a well-established and accepted phenomenon now. There's a lovely paper last year in the, in the science journal Science by a whole bunch of ecologists who work in marine and terrestrial systems pointing this out, that when we remove, in this case, apex predators, top predators, in this area, killer whales, or on Orcas Island historically, it would have been wolves and cougars, which were abundant here not that long ago. Uh, when we take those out of the systems, we often get systems that look like on the left side there. That's a, uh, Central American forest with and without jaguars present, the same place after jaguars are reintroduced on the right side, uh, keeping herbivores down and allowing some of the vegetation to come up. And that lower picture is the same plot you can tell in Yellowstone. Most of you will have known that wolves have been reintroduced in Yellowstone. They've now been back about 20 years and vegetation is coming back quite dramatically 
even though they haven't really reduced the size of the elk population there, what they have done is change the behavior of the elk. The elk are much more sketchy about going into some places where there's a little bit of cover, and because of that, vegetation is able to recover, and not just the vegetation, all of the birds that go along with that vegetation. So many neotropical migrants, lots of warblers, which used to be very rare in Yellowstone, are now becoming very common in riparian areas where wolves have uh, indirectly assisted them in return. So what do we know about deer? I'm going to start off by talking about deer and then give you some other examples. What do we know about deer in this system in the islands? Well, the fact is we actually know very little other than that they're often a nuisance in our gardens and things like that. But a few people have studied them, and one of the places we've been able to study them in a relatively natural state is in the central coast of British Columbia, a place we often refer to now as the Great Bear Rainforest, but a lot of us still call it the Mid-Coast, adjacent to Haida Gwaii, uh, north of Vancouver Island and south of Prince Rupert. In that area, Chris Dermott and many others have been looking at deer and, and wolves and trying to understand how these, these systems work overall. And he's made some fairly straightforward observations. Uh, in this area, not surprisingly, wolves, uh, uh, about 80% of what they eat are deer on these islands in, in the central coast. And because of that, they often depopulate the small islands, little islands like Cypress Island around here or um, uh, I can't think of the name of some of the others, certainly little things like Crane Island. Maybe there'd be a deer on Crane Island for just a little while, but of course, uh, as cougars come and go and swim to places, it wouldn't be hard to depopulate that island. So what they found is on many of these areas, these islands get a rest for a period of years to decades uh, uh, as predators are uh, manipulating these populations. And as a consequence, vegetation communities look very different in the central coast than they do in areas uh, just adjacent where uh, wolves have been removed. We also know that when deer are introduced into islands in these areas where they weren't previously present, we see big, big changes in vegetation. So this is a plot or, or, or a graph you can see uh, by people like uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Martin and others for the re who are part of the research group on introduced species in Haida Gwaii. And what they've done over the years is uh, surveyed plant communities on islands that have had deer for different amounts of time. I don't know if uh, people know, but on Haida Gwaii, deer are not native. They were introduced there in the 1920s as, uh, as a species uh, that people wanted to proliferate so they could harvest. Uh, but we have a number of uh, islands that are still deer free. And we have other islands where they know the time at which deer arrived. And so what you've got is green, blue, and red bars there. And <clears throat> on the bottom, uh, the, the top set are forge forest edge plots. Those are the kind of plots you get if you kayak to uh, a little Haida Gwaii islet, uh, came out of your kayak and put a plot right on the shore and asked what was there. And what you can see across the top is that in the height range of vegetation from zero to 50 centimeters off the ground, where deer are absent, the green bars, you have a very high cover of vegetation, about 80% cover, not much fair ground, all herbaceous when you look down, or all plants. <laughs> On two islands that they looked at that had had deer for less than 20 years, they knew that because they section huckleberry bushes and the growth rings of huckleberry are very sensitive to deer, and so they can date when the deer show up. Uh, you can see that uh, vegetation cover is dramatically reduced. And of course, on the red bars are islands where deer have been present for more than 50 years, and their uh, vegetation is, uh, is much reduced. And you can see it's a little bit less of an effect at the tall vegetation heights, 150 to 400 centimeters, but the pattern is pretty clear. The bottom ones there are just forest interior plots away from the shore versus on the edge. The main, the, the idea here is that uh, the longer deer have been on these islands, the more dramatically vegetation is reduced. And you can see that quite strikingly in the plot, but you can see it much more strikingly just in a picture like this. When we think of Haida Gwaii, these people from BC, we think of big open areas with bryophyte understories, huge trees and openings. Well, that's not the natural state in Haida Gwaii. That's a state that is deer-induced. And it looks like on the right there, that's an island, uh, reef island, uh, with very high deer densities. And that's Steve Allenbear standing on a deerless island, one that hasn't had deer right next door. And so the Haida Gwaii that we didn't know about uh, was the one free of deer, which you can only see in a few places where deer haven't yet come, or in a couple places now that are recovering after deer have been removed. This is kind of a direct effect of deer on vegetation, but it has very strong indirect effects 
on other kinds of species. You can imagine that if you remove the shrub understory, you're going to affect a lot of the species that rely on those kinds of things. And so if you look at a bird community, you might expect that the ones that depend on shrubs and ground areas for nesting and feeding might be impacted. And not surprisingly, if you go and survey birds in these areas, you find big declines in the abundance of these species which depend <clears throat> on that layer. And the same is true, and I could show you data on pollinators, invertebrates, other kinds of things which are linked. So very strong effects, in this case, of introducing deer and having trickle-down effects to the rest of the system. What we do know in the Georgia Basin in our area from uh, pioneer records and others is that predators were common, abundant, super abundant in this area, so much so that they were a real problem for people who were bringing livestock to the area in the future. You'll see lots, or, or, or who brought livestock area to the areas with them. And so you see lots of examples in the Salt Spring Museum of uh, stories about uh, 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 problems settlers had had with cougars cougar skins and other things, and we know now that they've mostly been re uh, removed from the area. Well, one of the things we've been doing over the past few years is looking in this area, the dark gray there, which is the southern, southeastern part of Vancouver Island. You can actually just see orcas down in the, in the a light gray there in the very bottom right, and there's some different colored dots, and that's because we put in plant plots in some of these places. We do a lot of uh, bird counts. We'll, I'll, I'll show you about to a census bird communities and we also um, census other kinds of things. And so for a long time we've been looking at the biological com the communities that exist on islands with and without deer and with different densities of deer to try and ask if the same kinds of things that we've seen happen in the Midwest <clears throat> or in cases like Haida Gwaii where deer have been introdu introduced also uh, happen in our area. And uh, they do. This is Mesha Island. Some of you will know that very close by. Uh, very typical kind of an island with a very thick understory. Very much like Haida Gwaii without deer. Uh, that's that picture of Steve Allenbear there. Here's Sydney Island, which is just off Sydney. This is an area where we don't just have uh, very abundant black-tailed deer. We also have fallow deer, which are an exotic deer, which has in, been introduced and is actually spreading quite rapidly through the Gulf Islands right now. I don't think it's in the San Juan Islands. It is? Yeah. On to Spiden, right. There's a lot of stuff on Spiden. <laughs> used to be rhinos on Spiden. Um, <clears throat> and when you look at this, you might say, oh my gosh, deer can't do this. But they can. We put an exclosure up in 15 years. Uh, this is what you get coming back. Uh, you get a dramatically different community uh, with and without deer. And again, the community is uh, one that's uh, quite uh, which isn't just supporting plants, it's supporting all of the species with it. But still, of course, we'd like to know, you know, what is the natural state of this ecosystem and can deer really be driving uh, biodiversity loss uh, to the degree I'm suggesting? I'll just show you a little bit more uh, to uh, suggest that we're pretty convinced this is the case. Um, just two summers ago, I had some undergrads uh, doing a simple experiment looking at the palatability of shrubs to first find out what deer like to eat and then make predictions about based on what they eat, do we see, can we predict what we see across islands where deer are present and absent? And so this is a simple example of a cafeteria experiment there. Annalise Barber has uh, 12 little vases and she's gone and cut uh, various uh, shrubs. Uh, she's counted all the leaves on those shrubs and she's putting them in there about eight o'clock in the evening. And some of those we expect are quite palatable and tasty. Some of those we know are relatively unpalatable. And Annalise comes back every half hour and then the next morning and measures the rate of vegetation removal. And so here's the kind of data you get on the x-axis that says time in hours. Those are half hour intervals up until the last one is overnight. And then you can't read those, but I'll just give you some ideas. That top green one is dull organ grape, which many of you will know is a coarse and relatively unpalatable plant. And it's probably one of the commonest plants in the understory in your island, I would say. Uh, the, the other one there, the yellow one, that's scotch broom. Many, many of you will know that. It's a fairly pernicious invasive, uh, which the deer will eat in a pinch, and they'll eat on this island, Piers Island. All those others, the orange is orange honeysuckle, uh, uh, a beautiful and prolific plant. The purple is hairy honeysuckle. Uh, the pink is nutka rose. <clears throat> and the white is Saskatoon, which is a classic uh, deer forage. The main point in, is that by the next morning, all of these things are denuded of all of their vegetation. 
Now, what do you expect to see on islands? Well, if deer are driving what you see in terms of shrub communities, you would expect to see very few palatable plants on islands with deer, and of course that is what you see. On the top graph there, uh, we've got mean shrub cover. So these are 10 by 10 meter plots. We estimate the cover of each species uh, in that area, in this case just woody plants. We're not talking about uh, uh, any of the ephemerals. And so it has mean cover. <clears throat> Across the uh, horizontal axis, you see deer density, and that's just a proxy. Those are pellet counts in, in, uh, in transects. I won't go into it too much. But up at the top, you've got what we think of as the relatively unpalatable species. The green one is Salal. It actually increases on the, on the far left, that's islands with no deer. On the point, point 0.5, there are islands with very low deer density, just enough so you can hardly uh, find pellets, but you'll find a few, and you know they're there. And then what you'll see then is that Salal actually increases, and so does dull, dull organ grape, and a, not so much Scotch broom. A red huckleberry is the red one there. They actually increase a little bit in the presence of deer, but at very high deer densities, like on Sydney Island or Jones Island nearby, if you've ever been to Jones, uh, you'll see that those shrubs are uh, just, even the palatable ones, disappear. The bottom ones there are the ones that we often think of as supp supplying most of the color and. And, and diversity. Uh, orange, you can't see at the very bottom, it's under the yellow one, that's Arbutus. Many of you know Arbutus, or Madrona, I think you call it here. Uh, um, uh, Madrona is a very uh, uh, iconic plant, but on many of these islands, I'll challenge you to go and find uh, much uh, uh, in small diameter. And uh, we actually know that if you look at the diameter of these plants, they're very well predicted uh, uh, by, by deer density. Arbutus essentially disappear uh, on islands with high deer density. Now we still have them because there are many that are tall trees, but I'll attempt to shock you and tell you that in 50 to 100 years we won't have Arbutus uh, in many of these islands because they senesce uh, after a couple of hundred years and there's simply no recruitment in many places with high deer density now. Uh, we can start to see that happening here, but the same is true for many others. The yellow is orange honeysuckle, which a lot of you probably really welcome. I do every May because that's where you see the hummingbirds show up uh, just after they hit the flowering current. And the red is nooka rose, uh, the white is uh, snowberry in this case. I don't have them all on there. Uh, over the left, uh, you'll see a, an easy index that we've come uh, to use, that's ocean spray. Many of you will know ocean spray, holodiscus, it's in the rose family, it's very palatable. And what it does is, in the absence of deer, it'll grow more or less like a beach ball shape, because it, it recruits from the bottom like a lilac, almost all new vegetation uh, suckers from the bottom. But when deer are there eating that, you start to get something progressively that looks like that bottom one, more of an umbrella shaped one. And all you have to do in the Gulf Islands is measure the ratio of the width of that plant at a half meter off the ground to one and a half meters, divide them, and you can uh, predict deer density uh, almost perfectly. Uh, that's a very, very good indicator. Not only can you predict deer density, you can predict understory bird density, you can predict the cover of non-native plants in the meadows adjacent to those things. It's a very good index. And for us, it's quite uh, pervasive evidence that deer are driving things. Here's another example. <clears throat> that top island is Link Island. The bottom <laughs> island is Ruxton. Those are 800 meters apart, but Ruxton hasn't had deer on it in the memory of anyone I've run into there. Uh, and they look very, very different. One has a high species diversity, lots of cover. The other, again, looks like Haida Gwaii, but you're kind of a, a common area. On the graphs there, Again, you've got on the top native cover, and what you can see is that in the absence of deer, you get about 110% cover. That's because you've got overlap of plants, some of the lower ones, the other ones, but down to about 20% cover at the highest deer density. That's like Sydney Island or Jones Island, which I showed you before. And species richness is really probably the thing that's most shocking to me. Again, in the absence of deer on islands around here, you might have 18 species within a 10 meter plot. Uh, at the highest deer densities, you might have four. And you know what four those are going to be. Organ grape, salal, broom, and something else. Uh, and so there's very, very strong and dramatic effects. And so we do know, in this case, that the abundance of deer is now driving most of what you see. As a matter of fact, I often tell botanists uh, who work for the ministries in the Georgia Basin in, in BC <coughs> that uh, 
about 60% of the variation in plant communities they see in the Georgia Basin is due solely to deer. It has nothing to do with soil, moisture, or anything else. Deer are driving the communities. They also do things, I won't go into it a lot, uh, they do the same kinds of things here as they do in Haida Gwaii. I won't get into a complicated graph too much. On the right though, it does, or, on, it says, or left, it, uh, the vertical axis, that's log abundance, the log number of birds. Uh, the little axis, <coughs> Uh, they've all been kind of standardized in abundance, so that's the zero point. Then I've got low, moderate, and high. That's low islands with low deer density, moderate, and high. Because there's two lines there, it's just showing you that the pattern in the Gulf Islands is exactly what we see in the Charlottes. On the left, that's Rufus Hummingbird. You're all familiar with Rufus Hummingbird? Three orders of magnitude more common in the absence of deer than in the presence. Yes, you all still see Rufus Hummingbirds on your around your property. Why? Because many of you have feeders, because many of you have plants, but if you walk into the forest uh, you'll find you'll have a hard time finding them. Uh, and if you compare forest plots on islands with and without deer you'll see about three orders of magnitude more hummingbirds in the absence of deer than the presence. And the same holds for almost all of the small body birds which use that shrub understory. And these I could go on and on. I'm going to give you, show you a couple others. Uh, we've also uh, asked whether deer are driving much of what we see in our oak meadows. I don't know if you call them Gary Oak Meadows here. We often do. And many of you have been lucky enough to visit some of the islands in maybe the second week of May, first week of May, which is my typical favorite time to go, when uh, camas on the left or on the right there, or sea blush, plectritis, is blooming like crazy. Uh, and you're the, on tender hooks, even wanting to step anywhere because of the amazing vegetative cover in these places. Well, one of the things we were interested in is why on the bigger islands like Orcas we had a hard time finding those kinds of meadows in, uh, in such luxuriant states as we might uh, see on some of the smaller islands without deer. This is a, um, some work from Salt Spring Island where we put in about 90 exclosures and in and out of those exclosures we planted these plants, uh, camas lilies, uh, which of course were widely collected by First Nations and farmed over most of the landscape as a, uh, the sole source of starch in the area. And plectritis is just a, a, a plant that I, uh, uh, that I like and work on, so we used it. And I won't talk so much about the different treatments there, but I'll just show, say that the, uh, what we found is over three years, <coughs> sea blush increased by almost 300% uh, uh, inside of exclosures, but the yellow and, uh, or the brown and orange ones are outside of exclosures. It went extinct in all the places we planted out in three years in Salt Spring. And camas lilies there, that little blue line represents the average size of the bulbs we planted in and outside of exclosures. On the left are outside of exclosures. On the right is inside of exclosures. They just start blooming at about, uh, about three grams, about three and a half grams. So after three years, so the average bulb that was about two and a half grams was blooming inside the exclosures, but they were all gotten, getting smaller outside the exclosures, and they will eventually uh, disappear. They'll often, if some of you know some of these lilies, camas, chocolate, some of these others, they will be able to persist as a tiny, tiny little plant that is so small that it essentially avoids herbivory, but it can't ever get big enough. So in a lot of these places, it's quite interesting. We were surprised here that we found almost no natives, but inside our exclosures, many of the natives came up uh, uh, because they'd been released from browsing pressure. So a good message because it suggests that a lot of these meadows actually still have some of the natives in them. They're just hard to see. And not surprisingly, if you just look at cross islands and again look at pellet density from low to high, in this case the richness of meadow plants generally, the black dots there is the richness of native meadow plants, the ephemerals we think about, and you can see that that goes down very, very strongly. On islands with no deer, typically 15 species, this is a one meter plot now, uh, down to about four species of natives in the highest deer density. Uh, exotics uh, don't uh, necessarily go up a lot, but the ratio of non-native to native is well explained by deer. So what is the short lesson here? Well, Deer in the Gulf and San Juan Islands now escape predation uh, by most native predators. They're rarely hunted on most islands. Many of the Canadian San, uh, Gulf Islands or Canadian San Juans, is, it's now illegal to hunt because in 1972, around Earth Day, many of the people moving to the islands felt like the best way to 
treat the islands was to stop doing some of the things we'd been doing historically, over-harvesting populations. So we now have a situation of deer hunting being illegal in many of these places. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, uh, deer now exist at about 10 times the density on our islands that they would historically, or that they do in areas where wolves are present just a little ways north in the coast. On many islands, we have good records uh, of the plants that were there. We're starting to collect historical photographs that people have taken 50, 60 years ago of their favorite meadow off on the front lawn of the house, the, the family house. Uh, and uh, we're finding that many of these species are now extirpated on the smaller islands that deer uh, are abundant on. So what do we do? Well, <clears throat> I first want to just show you that it's a much bigger problem, of course, than just deer. Let me just introduce you to another pro uh, uh, animal you some of you probably know. Uh, I would guess many of you know, might know what a brown-headed cowbird is. This is a blackbird. It's a very interesting bird. It's a parasitic blackbird. It doesn't build its own nest. It lays its eggs in the nests of other birds. And it's a North American native. Historically, it was found with bison. A lot of people uh, uh, figure that the migratory habits of bison might have uh, 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 helped it develop this adaptation of parasitizing other birds by laying in other nests and then uh, not taking care of its kids. So it parasitizes a whole bunch of hosts, actually about 200 birds in North America, but mostly they're small-bodied passerines, sparrows, warblers, flycatchers, vireos. One of the interesting things about cowbirds is we're the ones who really control their distribution because as we've spread uh, agriculture and pastures and livestock, we've spread the distribution of cowbirds uh, throughout the region. Now, why is this an issue? Well, cowbirds do have impacts on their hosts. Till recently, we thought they were fairly modest. They mostly had to do with uh, cowbirds usurping parental care, uh, reducing clutch size because female cowbirds take one egg out the day before they lay their own, and so they'll reduce fecundity of the hosts. And they sometimes induce nest abandonment. Some of the warblers, once they're parasitized, will leave, so that slows the warbler down, has to start another nest. That's a cowbird on the left at the top and a song sparrow young on the right. I've worked on song sparrows for many, many years. Those guys are six days old. That's a very typical kind of thing. So, uh, and so we've often thought the effects were a bit uh, modest, but I want to show you a, a quick video. This is a blue wing warbler. A friend of mine, Phil Elliott in the East Coast, uh, uh, sent this to me because I'd written some papers about some things I thought cowbirds did that people weren't very aware of. And uh, he said, what do you know? So this is a male blue wing warbler. He was studying parental care and interested in how males took care of their kids. That, there's a little nest. This is on the ground. It's in Connecticut. But we have warblers here, no ground nesting warblers, but we have lots of shrub and tree nesting warblers. There's seven young in that nest. And you'll see a cowbird come in in just a second. It's only a minute long. There she is. Now watch the way she uses her head. You can see she's a stabbing motion. This, I'll show you some pictures of some kids in just a second. Some people find this disturbing. Um, I actually, I don't know, it's a little bit disturbing, but you know, all of us, all of us pray when we go to Africa to see a cheetah chasing an impala and getting it, right? Well, this is the same. I don't know how many have been thrilled to see a merlin getting a shorebird on the, uh, during migration around here, or a cooper's hawk uh, taking a, a bird. But that's, this is an extremely uh, highly evolved bird, which is, um, she's just out of the picture right now, but she'll come back. Looks in the nest, looking around, making sure she's done her job. Checks the kids outside, and then she'll be gone. Well, why would she do this? Why would she do this? Is she just mean? Probably not. It's probably something that she does to enhance her ability to produce young. And of course, one of the things I mentioned to you is that they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, right? But if they want their kid to hatch at the same time as the host, they have to have a nest which is 
in the laying stage. Any female who has a nest which has advanced eggs or young is not useful to her. But if she causes that nest to fail, that mum will start a new nest within about six days. So the cowbird can farm the host very well, and we know that they do that here. Uh, we've been working on song sparrow populations for some time. And we saw when I started looking at song sparrows like this, these are from a little island like Skull Island where there's no, there's no predators or scavengers. And I started seeing little song sparrows. These are f uh, about three to four day old song sparrows with these contusions on them. And so those are that, that stabbing mark of that cowbird. So what she's doing is coming to islands. They start showing up about May 5th. The song sparrows have already, already been nesting as well as many of the other uh, resident songbirds but they're not available for that cowbird to lay in until she resets the host and get, gets it to lay and starts farming it. So they actually have fairly dramatic impacts on many of their hosts, not so much through those first things I showed you, but by causing nest failure. Why is this a problem? Well, cowbirds aren't native in this area uh, either. Uh, they were first showing in the Georgia Basin <clears throat> during the breeding season in 1964. We have some historic records that show they occasionally were in southern BC in the early 1900s, but those are all September, October records when blackbirds often flocking in the fall. Since then, however, as we've expanded agricultural use in the area, cowbirds have responded to our change in land use and our introduction of agricultural uh, fields and livestock and increased enormously in abundance and, of course, as a consequence, had big effects on hosts. We determine how many cowbirds there are and their distribution. Now, an interesting thing about cowbirds is that because they feed in association with livestock, they're limited in how far they can go to parasitize because a female has to spend energy uh, to build eggs, but also to go find nests to lay in. So they typically don't go more than about seven kilometers from their feeding areas. So if you localize those things, you'll localize cowbirds. So this is a map of the probability of en encountering a cowbird in this case, Vancouver Island's on the left. <clears throat> These are Gulf Islands. Orcas should be, they, sorry, I wiped out the, uh, the USN ones and the GIS here. We just have the Canadian side of it there. But uh, that's Stewart Island uh, and uh, Sydney Island, or uh, some of there. And the, the dark red are areas where you're likely to encounter a cowbird. And you'll see it's kind of spottily distributed. And I'll, I'll tell you that that's because those are islands uh, where cattle are run. <clears throat> and the yellow are areas where cattle are, where cowbirds are very scarce. We've been studying song sparrows for 40 years in the area, and we know a lot about how cowbirds drive their demography. In other words, affect whether the populations grow or decline. So we can use that cowbird distribution and the song sparrow distribution to actually map areas in the landscape where so cowbird pop or where, excuse me, songbird populations, song sparrow populations, are able to grow in the absence of cowbirds, and that's where it's dark red or where they're always going to decline on average because they simply can't produce another, enough kids to replace themselves. And those are the yellow areas. What we now know, the reason we study song sparrows is because they're an archetypical passerine, small passerine, open cup nesting bird. So we now know that cowbird distribution uh, is one of the best predictors of the abundance and diversity of small birds in the southern Gulf Islands, and we run that. We run that by distributing livestock and agricultural areas throughout the island. So we're determining by our land use whether or not host populations are growing or declining. And that includes most of the warblers, vireos, and flycatchers that are hosts of the cowbird. More trouble in paradise. In Canada, we, we call this the Canada goose. Uh, but most people in British Columbia, and perhaps some here, don't know that it's not native to the area. The memory of most uh, people about the history of this animal is past. Many of us will recognize it uh, as a migrant in the area. And in fact, if you go back to the early textbooks, Gige and Cowan, you'll see it as an occasional migrant up until about 1960. But an interesting history of the Canada goose is that we pretty much, we almost wiped it out in North America, especially the giant Canada goose, which was in the North American, the Midwestern flyway. When we were market hunting swans and whooping cranes and eating those for Christmas and Thanksgiving dinner uh, in uh, 1890 to 1920 until we passed the Migratory Bird Protection Act, we were also hunting these commercially. And in fact, the giant Canada goose was thought to be extinct in the Midwest, Northwest, or Midwest US until it was rediscovered in North Dakota, 22 animals on a North Dakota farm. People discovered some very large geese there 
We just, we, we, uh, 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 people rounded those geese up. Uh, we bred them like crazy because we wanted to reintroduce that. And wildlife agents all around North America reintroduced them uh, throughout North America, including uh, to here. They started breeding in our area in about 1970, and what you probably, I would guess, Canada geese are quite abundant in this area now. They're lovely birds, but they have big effects on the environment. Why? Because they're big composting agents. They, they eat enormous amounts of plant material, they digest it, and they poop it out. And when they do, uh, they provide a very high nitrogen fuel filled with little plant seeds. And many of you may not know, too, that we have almost no native grasses in this area. Certainly there's a small handful of species, but most grasses we have now that cover our landscape are non-natives. These guys particularly like Poa pretensis, turf grass. It's a non-native here, but it's their favorite food. It's well adapted to grazing, and they rapidly introduce it into small island communities where they like to nest in the absence of predators. So my guess is, is that this little island out here probably has geese nesting on it in the spring. And I guarantee, where they are, you'll find a pole pretentious grazing lawn, a very fine and well-clipped pole lawn that is maintained by the gander uh, and, uh, and, and spreads throughout the island. So I won't go into all the things that geese do. We've done lots of experiments with exclosures and other kinds of things, like with the deer. I'll just show you a couple of pictures. The top is the Nanaimo estuary on southeast Vancouver Island. 1978 is about Five years after geese were first seen, resident Canada geese were first seen in that estuary. That's August 2005. Geese like to eat the roots of sedges and grasses, particularly in estuaries. And when they do, they have dramatic effects on that community over time. That has real consequences for salmon populations because many salmon rear in these estuaries, and the estuaries are dramatically changed in the presence of geese versus the absence. The other is one of my favorite meadows. I got the first nest in Canada goose in the Gulf Islands, 1983. I recorded that nest not very long ago. Well, that used to be one of my favorite little meadows. That top picture is from about 1985. The bottom picture is from just a few years ago. And one is the meadow in the presence of geese. One is the meadow in the absence of geese. And we're rapidly seeing this kind of change throughout many of the small islands through the area. As geese introduce plants, introduce nitrogen, which the local natives are not adapted to, but grasses are extremely well adapted to. So they very rapidly convert these communities. Okay. <clears throat> Do these kinds of changes really matter? I mean, geese are great. We've got, I mean, they're nice to hear in the fall. I've been enjoying them. The, can't, the snow geese are probably here. I don't know if you've heard them going overhead. I love hearing the geese in the fall coming back. But of course, for many of us, it is concerning that we're seeing such rapid changes in ecosystems. Many of us in our lifetimes have seen places we're very familiar with be utterly changed, like the estuary I showed you or Little Shell Island, which I showed you that picture from. And <clears throat> in Canada, in any case, and I'm sure here too, we're of course uh, quite concerned about maintaining representative examples of ecosystems. We call uh, the area we live in, the Arbutus Oak Fir System, the coastal Douglas fir ecosystem. In Canada, it's considered the most biodiverse system in Canada. It's also now the most imperiled. Why? Because we have 115 species at risk. Our Species at Risk Act is like your Endangered Species Act. So in this little area, we now are managing 115 endangered species. And many of the species I talked about are going to be on the list. I know it sounds crazy, but I think Arbutus will be on the list in 50 years if we don't do anything about it. We also, of course, know that we've rapidly changed it. Some of the old growth forests, which we uh, revere when we see them, are, are very scarce. Less than 1% of the original old growth exists in this area. Less than 5% of the oak woodlands that we can map historically and photograph still exist. Uh, it's a, a, a challenging area to work because, of course, we've converted a lot of it permanently to human use. That's the same southeast Vancouver Island I showed you. Red is urban area, pink is agricultural, rural and green is forested land. So, of course, we've converted, and so what we have left to work with is more limited. And then, because the area is largely privately held, we're further constrained into those areas that the government uh, can directly act on. One of the things that has really struck me as we've been working in the coastal Douglas fir is that it's clear to us that commensal species are really multiplying those kind of land conversion and other deleterious effects humans have had 
through those indirect kinds of effects. We have many, many agents working on our behalf in ecosystems now. Uh, and they're the direct result of the way we've modified. You know, we don't have to feel too bad about that, really, I don't think. We just want to think about how can we respond now? How do we think about the way we in, in affect species and try and adjust, either through land use or other kinds of ways? What can we do? I'm going to try and give you a couple of relatively quick examples. Very briefly, I'll give one example of land use planning and some tax incentives we're talking to the government about now. I think there's a role for stewardship. I'll just measure it very, mention it very uh, uh, <clears throat> briefly. But uh, a lot of us are working now to promote the responsible use of uh, animals, uh, deer, geese, others, through harvest, to try and protect some of these native ecosystems and species, at least in some places, to restore the hunting tradition uh, or, where possible, restore some of the apex predators, which I, I, Joe says there aren't any cougars on this island yet, but I will tell you there's three cougars on Salt Spring Island now, and they're living very well with the people there. Bears are now on Salt Spring, and they just dispersed to Saturna Island this year. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, I don't know that they'll ever be at the densities to do quite what we want, but there are some interesting things happening. Many of us are interested in restoration. How do we understand what's going on in the land and think about how we can identify and conserve some of the healthiest bits of the landscape that remain and try and support some of these native populations and species. And then the last thing I'm just going to mention is when we think about how to do it, we need to think about the appropriate ecological baselines and states of nature we're interested in. Again, uh, many people don't realize, and it actually most of the biologists in BC didn't realize that Canada geese weren't native. I actually had to write three papers in peer-reviewed academic journals doing all the research before I could convince the biologists, the federal biologists working for Canadian Wildlife Service and the BC Ministry of the Environment that the animals were not native. Parks Canada, because Parks Canada couldn't manage native species, but they could manage non-natives. Uh, and so uh, they couldn't act until they knew that they, in fact, were not native. What kinds of incentives? Well, I mentioned to you that they had kind of a spotty map. This is that map of where song sparrow populations grow again. And <clears throat> the, in the yellow places, they decline. In the red places, they increase in abundance. And if you look at where those arrows point, they point to three islands. And those are interesting islands. They're all owned by whole families. Uh, they're actually very conservation-minded families. I won't uh, mention them, but I think they do a pretty good job of managing their islands. But we have something called the Agricultural Land Reserve in Canada. Uh, if you run your large prop property as an agricultural area, you can reduce your property tax enormously. If you generate $3,000 worth of gross agricultural commodity, you get an 85% reduction in your property tax. Well, if you own a large island like that middle one, your property tax is about $850,000 a year. But if you produce $3,000 worth of cattle a year, not hard to do, 50 Angus, sell three of them, uh, or what have you. Uh, you can pay someone to take care of that island, run cattle, and reduce your tax bill by $700,000. Who wouldn't do that? Everyone would do that. But of course, there's big indirect consequences of that policy, because by running cattle, you introduce cowbirds, and you probably are preventing the production of 250,000 small-bodied passerines every year just due to the cows on that island alone. Why not pay those people not to run cattle? I've actually suggested that to the, to the minister in BC, and he says, how can, we, how can we pay billionaires not to do anything? I mean, how can we do that? Uh, and I, because it's cheaper than buying the land. Uh, they're actually, uh, with the, if we would just give them that break for not, say, you shouldn't, we'll still give you the same break for not running cattle, uh, we'd be growing uh, almost a million passerines every year. It's actually pretty cheap. What about stewardship? I, I, I put a slide together very quick. I didn't have much in this. Let me just say that I think there is a role for many of us. Uh, it's not always palatable. I'm not personally a hunter. I've never really been in my life. I used to eat lots of meat in East Africa, but all from the rangers, poached animals. Uh, I, I've, I've shot hundreds of African animals, but they all get up after I shoot them, and <laughs> after I give them a reverser. So I, I have a hard time shooting and killing animals, just like a lot of people do, but I, I think it's really clear that there's a role in places where we've removed apex predators or introduced species like this that we need to think about the trade-offs. It's often unpleasant uh, to deal with these things, but your choice is 
uh, you're either allowing several species, many, many species, to go extinct, or you're uh, engaging in an annual opportunity to uh, find some local hormone-free uh, uh, hormone meat. And, uh, and so we've started working in the islands to find hunters who are willing to adopt young people who've never been exposed to hunting, uh, mentor them, and take them out and start thinking about how to feed themselves locally versus feeding, finding commercial sources of meat, and by doing so, uh, helping to maintain some of these systems as a consequence. What about restoring things? Well, certainly this is something we like to think about. We've been starting working in a fair, fairly big projects in the Georgia Basin to try and restore some of the old growth Douglas fir forests uh, that we think about. Uh, ones that spotted owls, marble murrelets uh, used to be abundant in. Um, <clears throat> we probably aren't going to get those species back, but we would like to make sure that creepers, townsends, warblers, and many of our salmon are still benefiting from the benefits of these older streams. And even if we aren't going to get murrelets and owls back, we think we can get many of the uh, uh, commoner species back and support and support them into the future. What we've been doing is mapping the distribution of species to still find out where high quality areas are. And I'll just say that uh, birders do this or biologists do this by going and doing what we call them point counts. You go to a place with your GPS, you stand there for 10 minutes and you record everything you hear within a 50 meter radius or whatever within uh, That's what a deer-free island sounds like. <laughs> I, didn't bring the, I didn't bring the deer to I, the, the other one. But we'll sit, stand there. We'll map these birds. We can get, we can get an idea. We visit, we've got 600 point counts in the, in the Georgia Basin. We visit those three times. We get an idea of how reliably Rufus Hummingbird. You get the idea? Um, uh, and we can map those birds throughout the area just the way I map those song sparrows and cowbirds. Those maps look like this. One's on the right there, brown creeper, red-breasted nuthatch, all of sight of flycatcher now endangered, by the way, uh, and uh, yellow rump warbler. We'll take forest birds. In this case, we use about 18 birds that experts tell us are generally reliant on the characteristics of large old trees, old forests and gaps. And we'll combine those to get a map like that one on the right, where dark green are places where you're likely to encounter the old forest bird community. We do this because that starts to incorporate those indirect effects. The birds are generally absent from places where we've done things like encouraged cowbirds that cause those populations to go down. But this tells us where those populations are still relatively uh, uh, healthy. And it starts to be candidates for con conservation. So this is the same picture now just with areas where you have a 95% or higher probability of getting the whole forest bird community, the old forest bird community. The purple areas are areas that are reserved already inside parks. I won't show you the analysis. It's unfortunate the parks don't actually support very many birds, but that's a lot like I mentioned to you with uh, deer in the Midwest. A lot of our parks aren't necessarily well placed. But we're now working with private landowners and others to try and think about how we can acquire those lands where populations are maintaining themselves and relatively intact, i.e. they've demonstrated that they're relatively immune from those indirect effects. We know we aren't going to remove cattle from the landscape. Uh, we, we want to try and insulate our areas from them. How are we going to do it? You, uh, you uh, all, all know the price of land in this area. Uh, we can't always do it through acquiring land, so we've been looking for some novel ways to do it. This is a map of standing carbon. Uh, at Saanich Peninsula, is the red thing sticking up there, Sydney, and the Schwartz Bay Ferry Terminal is at the top. The middle island there is Salt Spring Island. Uh, the light gray ones where I haven't mapped carbon are just on the US side down there. Dark green uh, are older forests and higher standing carbon. Right now, those old forest patches on the carbon markets at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange are worth four to $10,000 per hectare. Shell and other companies are writing contracts. They'll pay people to maintain that carbon there uh, over a contract. Uh, we have negotiated a couple of contracts now. NCC used one in eastern BC in a place called the Dark Woods. $15 million out of an $80 million purchase was funded by carbon contracts, in this case from Shell. 
uh, in order to keep that carbon on the, la on the land. And so we know that isn't going to buy land, but it's starting to offset the opportunity costs of development. And we've got many landowners quite interested in rather than selling and dividing their lands, keeping it as the family trust, putting it in contracts, and hopefully taking that back into fairly old forest. I will say that many of these forests are 80 to 120 years old on average, so an 80-year contract is going to get them to 200 years. And uh, optimists like me think in 200 years we're going to be smart enough not to want to cut down those old forests again. So we think things will change. But we need to also think about when we're doing these kinds of things about how much things have, have changed, what we can realistically bring back, and make sure that we know the states of nature we're after. How do we measure success? Well, one of the ways is to do it is to make sure we have accurate baseline descriptions of what things are. This is a picture of my lunch in 1983 on Mandardi Island when I was a graduate student starting to study birds. I don't know if anybody sees what's unusual about this. Those are pinto abalone. I used to eat them all the time. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. That's an endangered species in both sides of the border right now. You can't find those. Uh, very hard to find. But I swear to God, in 1983, at any two-foot tide, you could have gotten pinto abalones to your heart's content. They were abundant. Uh, they've, things have changed very, very rapidly. But you know what? I often think about that and I think, geez, you know, things have changed a lot. You know, things used to be lovely in 1983. That meadow didn't have geese in it yet and I was taking that lovely picture and now things have changed. But it's easy to forget how much th things have changed. Many of you may not know that this species used to be abundant in this area. Basking sharks. Joe just showed me a lovely video. Uh, basking sharks are large filter feeding sharks which were enormously abundant in this area, and they're enormous in themselves. You can see a swimmer next to that one. That's off the Canary Islands, or a kayaker in this one. I often wonder what it would be like, what kind of an industry we'd have, a tourist industry, if we had thousands of these animals in the area and you could swim with them. Well, we did have thousands of animals in these areas until about the year I was born. We got rid of them, uh, the last ones, in the early 60s. How did we get rid of them? Well, I'll let you read this. This is a Victoria Times, 1955. That was a comment. And of course, you know, times have changed. We don't want to dwell on it too much. We had different ideas about nature and the degree to which we were impacting it uh, when many of us were younger. People didn't realize in some ways uh, what things were, but at that time, there were 400 basking sharks, 20 to 40 feet long, in Nanaimo Harbor. There were thousands in the Georgia Basin. They were such a problem that the ferries had a hard time getting into the ferry terminals. And fishermen who were putting out their gill nets in the fall for salmon had a real trouble when a 40-foot basking shark wandered into their gill net. And so what happened was, in the 1940s, when those basking sharks <clears throat> were giving trouble, the Canadian packers lobbied the federal minister to have them put on the pest list. And they were put on the pest list. And in 1955 to 1969, a patrol vessel, federal patrol vessel called the Comox Post, worked the Georgia Basin up to the border, perhaps over. It was fitted with a three meter blade on the front. That's popular mechanics cut off. That's 1959, popular mechanics article, and that's a picture of the Comox posts slicing through a basking shark. That's what we did. We drove that boat through the Georgia Basin until all the basking sharks were gone, although Joe uh, showed me that there was uh, a couple were seen off Salmon Bank just a couple of years ago. Basking sharks are very rare worldwide, but we had thousands of them in the Georgia Basin just recently. So just even though, you know, abalone is my baseline, Somebody just a little bit older, abundant basking sharks is their baseline. And of course that goes back. Some people may not know what this organism is, but the stellar sea cow. It's now extinct, the last of the Pleistocene megafauna to make it into the modern times. Used to be distributed from California to the Aleutian Islands. Uh, but it was heavily hunted by First Nations. The First Nations hunters were of course very efficient, uh, um, uh, probably because they were hunting mastodon, ground sloth, bison, which used to be on this island and San Juan Island historically. Uh, but as they got rid of those fauna, they worked into the marine fauna and 
sea cows were the, one of the first ones to go. So we need to realize, of course, that some things aren't going to come back, that there's been a long history of change, and we need to think hard when we do restoration that we make sure uh, that we have a clear idea and that we're not subject to this idea of shifting baselines. Often in the absence of historical research, like whether geese are native or not, we start to assume that what we see today is natural. You go out to Skull Island, it probably looks really good, or a lot of times we, we, we sit as the sun's going down, we look through the Arbutus over a lovely vista on the island, and we think, my gosh, this is the most beautiful place in the world, and it is, of course. But we can't lose sight of the fact that a lot has changed, and that we want to have that in our minds uh, when we're thinking about restoration. We want to have some ideas about what this place could look like uh, and did look like relatively recently so that we can keep that uh, in our mind. For me, not being able to harvest pinto abalone at any two-foot tide is a real crime, but in some, you know, maybe my kids are going to be uh, 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 remembering when you could get a jellyfish burger and you can't anymore because we've harvested them all out. Baselines shift very quickly, and the states of nature and what you become accustomed to uh, can be something that's a bit dangerous, so, so keep that in mind. I'll also just leave with one little uh, 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 point, one other point. You know, not all declines are necessarily bad. Uh, uh, I'm not saying they're really good, but we want to put those things in, in, in context. These are some data for double-crested cormorants and Galacus wing gulls from the Sydney Channel, where we have some large seabird colonies just across, just across the border, right near Stewart Island. And they were published by a Canadian Wildlife Service biologist, a bunch of biologists, talking about the catastrophic decline of seabirds. And there are some seabirds which we're quite worried about. But it was interesting that they were saying that this was probably a sign of, of decline. And I work on this island. I had on Mandardi Island, which were the large, these were one of the largest colonies is that these birds nest on. And I'd actually been there in 1985, and I'd been watching it come down, but I'd also done some research on that island, on the history, and knew that there were censuses all the way back to the late 1800s. Those birds were in decline, but actually at the turn of the last century, uh, they were at very low abundance. One of the alternate hypotheses then that that decline is a bad thing is that maybe those birds are just returning to baseline. If we go back, we know that there was a long period where we didn't take care of our refuse at all. We left it in open dumps. In the Georgia Basin off Vancouver, we now don't have any edible garbage in the landfills. It's only unedible stuff that goes in there, and we bury all of the, ship all the other stuff to Ashcroft and bury it. So there's no longer any human refuse available to the gulls. What we know is that the gulls were feeding their kids 70% human refuse in 1977. Now they don't feed it uh, very much of that at all, and the decline in gulls is almost perfectly predicted by responsible trash management in the Georgia Basin. Does that explain cormorants? Cormorants don't eat gulls. Well, we don't really know, but one of the things we do know is that we decimated eagle populations in this area through direct persecution and DDT. I used to work at the Burke Museum at the University of Washington when there were only 90, eagle pop, 90 nesting eagles. It's 1975, 90 nesting eagles in western Washington. You've probably got 90 nesting eagles on this island right now. Uh, they've come back very, very well. But of course, eagles do harass birds uh, in nesting colonies. And so one of the alternative ideas is that Maybe the cormorant's coming down. It's kind of sad if you like cormorants, but maybe it's actually a sign that things are returning to some kind of a baseline state as eagles have recovered and start to repopulate the area at historic densities. So we want to think about change. Certainly some is bad, but we want to understand it in a historical context so we can make good decisions about how to manage in the future. The other thing is oftentimes I just tell stories that just get people really depressed. I mean, they say, oh my God, things are horrible. But let me remind you, not everything is horrible. Uh, matter of fact, some things have uh, really turned out pretty good lately. Uh, when I was a kid, you didn't have a hope of seeing a gray whale. Uh, they were very scarce. We stopped hunting whales in this area in 1964. The, the, way, the last whaling ship that hunted the Georgia Basin is still floating. I know the people who live on it. Uh, it, was, it was very recently, just plying the coast at a whale town uh, and uh, taking gray whales. We, we know that 
uh, gray whales, since the cessation of whaling, have increased very rapidly, and they're now extremely common off the west coast. Many people think they're back at their historic densities. I used to be a kayak guide. I used to have to go to Queen Charlotte Islands, or the Queen Charlotte Sound, north of Vancouver Island, in 1983 to have a hope of seeing humpbacks. By the late 1980s, humpbacks were almost down to Tofino. By the mid-90s, they were abundant off Tofino and coming around Renfrew. You could see them in, the, in, the, in, that, in that area. My, uh, my field assistants sent me photos of two large humpbacks off Stewart Island, uh, right near Spiden this summer. Humpbacks are back in the Georgia Basin, and they're going to be regular visitors, I hope, uh, in the future. So, not all declines are bad, and some declines uh, that might be bad are reversible, and you need to remember that in the restoration context. There's no reason to give up. You just got to be cognizant about what's possible and uh, uh, what you have a good chance of, of bringing back. Some take-home messages. Really, I just want you to take away that main one I started with. We have pervasive effects on species, but I think most of them are through indirect routes. Overharvest isn't necessarily the problem anymore, but we have millions of agents working our, on our behalf throughout the landscape. We need to think about those kinds of things when we think about uh, restoration. Loss of apex predators is probably one of the biggest ones, along with land conversion and the introduction of exotic species. These are key threats in our system right now. We want to think about that. There's no doubt that if we're going to change things, stewardship, that's a euphemism for controlling overabundant animal populations. And so not just a euphemism. I would, uh, but uh, it is kind of shorthand for that. We're really going to have to engage in that. There's no doubt in, our, in, in my mind that uh, we're going to have to think carefully about how to do that. But some of it can be done through smart land use planning. We don't always have to control animals directly. We can think about how they respond to the landscape and our changes and try and manage it that way. Uh, restoration of extant species, definitely possible. I never would have thought humpbacks would be back in the strait, but I'm hoping fin whales are back because they used to be here uh, uh, before the time I die. I want to see a fin whale in the Georgia Strait. The last is when we think about these things, do some history, know your baseline condition. There's a real risk of assuming that things now are the way they should be or uh, that things as uh, your father tells you or mother tells you. Uh, go back uh, a little bit and uh, do some history to make sure you understand uh, what is a natural and not natural. Uh, part of this system. Thanks very much. I'll just say these are the these are the Hesse's, uh, uh, Werner and Hildy. They're, they've passed away now. That's Mandardi Island. They worked on that island in 1957 as undergrads, and they supported a lot of this work over the years because they'd also see things change and, and were quite interested in the historical tack we were taking. So thanks very much to them for uh, to this work. Thanks very much to you. Any questions you have? <laughs> Yes. Um, I uh, think that um, trying to save uh, the higher uh, order of species first is a mistake. What do you think about that? I like bugs. Oh. <laughs> I think grassroots up uh, seems to me like a better way than uh, whales, salmon, right. whatever. I, think, I, I would say it depends on the, on the system. I mean, in a case like, um, so bugs, I love bugs too, uh, <laughs> um, and invertebrates of all kinds. Um, but you know, uh, in, in the islands, probably the best way to enhance vertebrate populations is to reduce deer densities. The reason is, is because you increase foliage volume, and that means there's more for insects to eat, there's more places for them to hide, and, and you'll do that. Nectar feeders. One of the things we know is that, you know, we, I don't know how many people know, we have 350 species of bees in our area. Many, 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 many kinds of bees here. Uh, but on islands with lots of deer, you'll only have about a third of the assemblage that you have in the absence. So in some cases, I think, it, yeah, I mean, whales, they probably don't have a lot of direct effects. I mean, we love seeing them, but, but focusing just on whales might not cause other things to happen. But, intro, but, but getting a, putting a sterilized female cougar onto Courcy Island would probably be a lovely, or, or on Darcy Island would be a great idea. 
because uh, she could reduce deer density to very low densities very soon, and you would probably encourage uh, 35 species of plants um, to come back and hundreds of species of invertebrates. So I think it, I, I would say it probably depends on the case. Well, I like your more deer. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to put too much on the deer, but they're such uh, important actors. They taste good. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I was telling Joe, I mean, the, the conservation officers shot two cougars in Sydney, B.C. last year. Uh, they're breeding in a little place called Horth Park. It's about 15 acres in the middle of a residential area in North Saanich, and they shot two of the young ones that were dispersing out of that. But, you know, they haven't shot a couple others recently because those young ones were unfortunately looking a bit too interested in people and dogs and things like that. They were... Uh, and, but in other places where the animals are, um, you know, where there's enough prey and they're not getting into trouble uh, otherwise, they're doing very well. Wolves are occasionally in the Gulf Islands. Uh, I saw the last one, that one was shot in 1983 on Sydney Island, the biggest Vancouver Island wolf. It's now in the Royal British Columbia Museum. That animal dispersed from somewhere on South Vancouver Island. Wolves are uh, kind of occasionally seen, usually a single one, but uh, cougars will come in first. <laughs> Uh, you know, when I was uh, working in East Africa, we, uh, some people I knew were re trying to reintroduce ja or, uh, uh, not jaguars, uh, leopards into Nairobi Park. I don't know if some of you have probably been to Nairobi. There's a big park right on the edge. No one saw leopards in that park, so they radio collared them and let them in, and they kept getting killed. And they found out they were getting killed by the resident leopards that no one was seeing. Those leopards were there. They just didn't, people weren't aware of them. And so, uh, and actually that's been very good. There's, so cougars are moving in and I would guess they'll be here in the next 20 years, uh, if not sooner. And yeah, there was a wolf on Valdez Island last year and uh, there's black bears on Saturna now. Uh, so they're slowly coming back in. Black bears aren't gonna do too much to deer, but cougars, cougars do do a lot. Yes. Right. It's um, certainly, I mean, certainly logging enhances deer populations because when you, uh, when you log forests, you cause a release of uh, lots of shrubs, fireweed, all those kinds of things. You know, many people, uh, and so, uh, but if the deer weren't there, nothing would have happened. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, logging will have changed that place utterly in terms of the overstory. But, um, not, I'm not, not really an advocate of logging but, uh, by any means, but what I would say is that many of those places come back pretty well. It's just unfortunate it takes 800 years, <laughs> right? I mean, but they, they do come back pretty well, yeah. So uh, you said that the cougar and bear were, or wolves, is it wolves or bears? Cougar and bears are, are back in the Gulf Islands. Wolves have been in occasionally, but they have a harder time. Wolves get into trouble really easily. It seems like cougars seem to be better at staying under the radar. Absolutely. Yeah, wolves would be all through this area. I mean, they're abundant on Vancouver Island, and I'm sure if, if you went back and if there are, I'm sure there must be diaries of some of the early settlers in this area. Yeah, there's no doubt that cougars would have been resident. You, you would have probably, I mean, I'll take a wild guess, but I'm pretty, you probably would have had 25 cougars on this island or so, and uh, historically, and the deer density would have been much, much lower. Uh, any raccoons, uh, would have, uh, raccoons would have been extremely scarce because that would have been what they would have been eating uh, when they weren't getting deer. Not that raccoons are bad, but they're of course commoner now. So, but yeah, the cougars would have been common. Wolves would have come and go. Uh, wolves, wolves tend, cougars tend to drop out in the mid coast because w they, they don't do well with lots of wolves. So there is a, they don't, they don't live together that well. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, they swim. I've never seen one, but I know quite a few people who've seen cougars swimming in the in the islands. And deer, of course, swim too. Um, they'll they'll get to places, but re remarkably, many of the islands around here. My sense of looking at things is that if you have an island that's more than three and a half kilometers from the next nearest island, it shouldn't have deer on it on average. In other words, those islands are often ones which. Wolves will, and cougars would have occasionally got there and depopulated them, and deer very rarely get back to islands like that. 
Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so they would have been a common feature, um, and they would have they, they would have trapped lined islands. Cougars especially would have gone from island to island probably, living there for a couple of years until they brought deer densities down to an area that they were ready to swim, or the female stays and her, her sons have to go, right? Or the, the kids go because there isn't enough. So, yep, they would have been all through this area. Yes? It's hard to know. I often wonder about this. You know, I, I mean, in uh, um, in Europe, brown bears, which are the same species as our grizzly bear, we call them are almost the same. Uh, Ursus horribilis here, we call them Ursus arctos there, I think. But uh, you know, everyone will tell you that brown bears, uh, like they've come back like crazy in Slovakia, and they often live quite well with people. And wolves, I mean, in, in Spain, wolves are quite common in Spain and the Italian Alps, and they're, they're very rarely in contact with people. It's tempting as an evolutionary biologist to think that the long history of humans in Europe has led to wolves which are um, very good at avoiding humans because any of their ancestors which didn't avoid humans, which interacted too much with humans, were, were killed. And so I don't know that that's going to happen, but we've joked, you know, we biologists joke over a beer that we should bring European brown bears here because they've already learned to stay under the radar. But that, so it's facetious. I don't know how long it's going to, yes, I think they could. I think it might be a long time. We do know that cougars like the ones on Salt Spring Island, most residents don't know they're there. And the people who do know they're there often don't talk about it very much because people do worry about it, but they haven't caused problems. So, so it, it can happen, but certainly I can't guarantee that cougar's not going to eat your dog. You're, you're talking about how fast baselines can shift. So when you're trying to restore a habitat, how do you know what baseline to restore it to? Do you it, go pre-European or pre-native or pre-human? Well, I used to, I used to uh, deride, not deride, well, yes, I guess. Uh, parks can all the time because they had a big restoration thing. And I keep telling, saying, how do you know when you're done, guys? How do you know if you did the right job? Because they, they were telling me the Canada geese were native. And I said, you know, I mean, you got to have a good idea. So you don't really know, except unless you do your history lesson. Luckily, the, 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 the naturalist records around here are really quite good. There are some pretty good places. And then we, we also have the opportunity of looking at places that are relatively undeveloped. There are islands around here who have had much less history of human impact. And so we can use those a bit as baselines. That's what we do with the deer, right? We go to relatively isolated places and compare vegetation communities. Or in the, in, at Haida Gwaii, where you've got the opportunity to compare those which have deer and, and not. So depending on the case you're talking about, you can often find reasonable comparisons. What I worry about is when I'm finding that I'm around the table with biologists and half the biologists don't know what the history of the place was. So the first thing to do is to do your homework Take advantage of the r records that are there. Uh, use First Nations middens, uh, which people are now doing, to reconstruct the fauna of the area. That's how we know sea cows were common historically, because their parts are, are uh, uh, found in middens. And so, uh, so that's the first thing to do. Just, just do your research. And then, you know, we need, uh, there's only a few of us out on the landscape who kind of have this insatiable curiosity for what this place looked like. And so become a biologist and, and help us out. Yeah. The population of introduced rabbits is increasing fast on orchids. How do rabbits um, affect this vegetation compared to deer? You know, it's a great question, and uh, I, I don't know how to answer it. I mean, you know, uh, I have no idea. We haven't done any work on that. I imagine they have quite big impacts. I don't know a lot about the feeding habits uh, of rabbits, so uh, I would guess they have big impacts, but I, I can't tell you how. Someone was telling me today that That's the only thing left, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's surprising and hard to know. I mean, I have a good friend, Anna McDougall, who works on Gary Oak, and we don't understand why, why and how Gary Oak recruit. I mean, what makes the young uh, um, uh, come up. We don't really get it. He has done a bunch of experiments in the Cowichan Valley of Vancouver Island and showed that it's actually voles, uh, uh, Microtus pennsylvanicus, which is the main thing that is uh, regulating Gary Oak because they eat cambium in the in the winter and so you know we were wondering you know geez are, do, do oaks come up when there's some kind of a 
something that has somehow suppressed the voles for a long time? Because we haven't gotten rid of things that should suppress the voles. I mean, really, uh, minks are still common. Many of the small predators, uh, red-tailed hawks, Cooper's hawks, those things are still quite common. So there's a lot we don't understand. I'm sure the rabbits have a lot uh, going on. And basically what we'd have to do, I guess, is do an experiment, you know, find some places where there are rabbits but no deer. Some people have done this, put up exclosures so that the rabbits can get through and not the deer. That's a bit of a, it's a bit of a job to figure all that, that, those things out. So let, let's, um, let's call it here, because I know some people might have to go. If you have questions, you can come up. Let's give Peter a big round of applause for that. Okay. We'll see you guys next month, November 13th. Thanks very much for coming.